I just want to say that was such a touching prayer. I almost thought, I don't know if I can get up here and talk. I'm very moved by that. Thank you for praying for me. And you are a lucky group of people to have such a visionary pastor. Um, just in the, the conversations that I've had with him, I'm very, very impressed um, and very honored to be with each of you here today. I, um, I appreciated how Pastor Scott said his, one of his motivations was his own children, and I'm, I'm, I'm really... Um, in that same boat. The reason why I um, feel like I have just a little bit of a passion, a lot of bit of a passion actually for this is because I, um, just to get to give you a chance to learn about me a little bit, um, like you said, my name is Valerie Hamaker, and I have a high schooler, a middle schooler, and two elementary school children. So we've hit all of the different ages, um, schools, and, and I've got also, so my two daughters our sophomore in high school, eighth grader um, in middle school, and then I've got a, a fifth and a third grader, so, and their sons. So we've got a little bit of everything, and as you all know, who, um, who have families and children, um, we are all here today probably for the same reason, is that we care about our families deeply, and we want God to help us know how best to serve them well. So... Um, Just to give you a little introduction, I'll get through with this, and then for the rest of the time we won't have to talk about this, but I do, um, I just finished um, a little while back at Mid-American Nazarene University, Um, I'm still there often, so I'm on this side of town all the time, but I do have my own private practice at, in my home, um, in Lee Summit, so that it allows me to also be um, a stay-at-home mom as much as I possibly can as well, so it's kind of a a great combination. Um, I love working with children, I do play therapy, I love working with adolescents, um, and I do a lot of family therapy with, with adolescents that, that are going through hard times. And I do marriage counseling. And um, my, most recent, um, my, my most recent passion, I would say, is this. I, I just finished a certification in um, working with, with people that are struggling with sexual addictions. And to give you a little bit of background about that, that was not my um, original path. Um, I am mentored, and I'm, I'm very grateful to have the... I work closely with Dr. Todd Fry, and he had mentioned in, in our work together um, as a postgraduate supervisee that if I wanted to work with folks that are married, that I would be... Um, it would be in my best interest um, to work with... to have a, a deep knowledge of sexual addiction because that is what our culture is fighting right now. So I wasn't so interested even then until one day I was in my basement and I have the rare gift of being able to read while I exercise. I've read hundreds of pages while I've run hundreds of miles and I was reading and studying the gospel and um, very powerfully had an experience that this was what I was to do. And um, so I said, okay, I'll do it. And so I I have and I have the training and it has blessed my life. And... um, and so this is just a little piece of the blessing, so I thank you for letting me be here with you today. I want to start with a poem um, that brings us all to why we're here today. For whatever we're talking about and what, whatever the content is that brings you to church today, this speaks to me as to why we are here um, regarding how we care about our families. It's called The Echo. "'Twas a sheep, not a lamb, that strayed away in the parable Jesus told." a grown-up sheep that strayed away from the ninety and nine in the fold. And why, for the sheep, should we seek and earnestly hope and pray? Because there is danger when sheep go wrong, they lead the lambs astray. Lambs will follow the sheep you know, wherever the sheep may stray. When sheep go wrong, it won't take long till the lambs are as wrong as they. So, And so with the sheep we earnestly plead, For the sake of the lambs today. For when sheep are lost, what a terrible cost the lambs will have to pay. And when I heard that, that really, really struck me. Because we are here with families. And we want God to speak into us to know how best to speak to those we love most. And we live in a world where there is a lot going on that we are not very familiar with in terms of what the kids are exposed to. And I think that's what we're wanting to do is we want to learn how it is that we might best guide our children through the teachings of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the way he wants us to do that, um, I don't know how we're going to have to cue each other. What would you like me to say? Like, (laughs) 
next, um, is, is through the connection of the family. Um, the connection is the most fundamental of all human needs. And the, the way that God has arranged us to learn how to be made over in his image is through the family. And so here, so in the family, we learn all of the different ways in which we can come to know God and learn how to become more like him. And as we all know, it is like a laboratory, meaning that there are a lot of things that go on in the home that make it like an experiment, that we oftentimes don't know exactly what we're doing. And... Um, I think for me, that's, I'm very grateful for that as a therapist because with, a high, with high school and middle schoolers and elementary school children, no matter who I talk to, I have made mistakes with all of those ages. <laughs> and I try really hard and I'm trying to heal and do my very best that way. Um, but we know that um, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we're going to make mistakes. And it is through human relationships that we're learning how, how to help our children. All right, so... I want to talk today a lot about the importance of attachment between parents and children. Are there any of you who know what that means? The sort of the attachment theory or anything like that? Anybody? Do you want to say something about that? No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you know, so I'll just keep my... All right, so I'll say something about it. And I might, so, you'll re- so it's, it'll be louder. Um, all right, so from very early on in life we begin as very young children to display consistent behavior patterns when exposed to stressful situations. And these behavior patterns are called attachment styles, and they have everything to do with the relationship between the child and initially the child's primary attachment figure, which is usually the mother, especially in that first year to year and a half, and then thereafter with the mother and the father moving forward. Oftentimes the father is the supporting attachment figure for the mother, and then the mother is the primary attachment figure for the child. All right? And so what ends up happening is, is the brain, and I'm going to talk a lot more about the brain in future weeks, but just to give you a little bit of a snippet about this, the brain is rapidly developing from about the third trimester of pregnancy through about the second year of life. It doubles in size and it is growing and the neurons are multiplying exponentially for the first two years of life. So every single interaction between a child, a young child, and its primary attachment figure is drastically shaping that child's ability to know who he or she is. And so the way we parent from the very, very, very beginning is incredibly important in shaping the identity of the child and shaping the child's ability to know who he or she is and to know how he or she can be calmed when faced with the slings and arrows of this world, which all of us will encounter no matter what our situation is. I want to talk today about three different attachment styles, and then we're going to tie that to how that correlates with our culture's struggle with addiction. All right, so that's kind of how I'm going to set up today, and then we're going to end with, with kind of really honing in on how we can use our power that we have as parents to protect our children from the influences of the world. this world that is specifically addiction. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with a securely attached child. Um, a securely attached child has an attachment figure who is consistently accessible when the, when the child is distressed. And what I mean by that is the parent is around, is engaged in what the child's experienced, and um, is responsive. And that does not mean, I found a lot of comfort when I was learning this, that that does not mean that the, ch- that the parent is perfect. What it means is that when the parent misses, the parent repairs. So we're always in sort of a circle, I like to say. We're always somewhere between being attuned to our child, some sort of a disruption where things aren't so t- attuned, and a repair. And as long as we're completing the circle we are parenting in a way that is good enough. And studies have come to show that if we are attuned and working towards that attuned relationship with our child, even 33% of the time, that's actually good enough parenting and our children can become securely attached. Isn't that kind of a relief? <laughs> so so um, the, 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 the point, though, there is that we make that repair and that we're continuing to try to build a cohesive 
responsive, available, engaged relationship with our children. All right, now the next one I was going to talk about is the, the second point there, which is we are a mirror for the emotions of our children if we have securely attached children. And what that means is this. It means that when our children are young, they are not very articulate. Their brains, specifically the side of the brain that knows how to make sense of what they're feeling, is not well enough developed to know how to make sense of what they're experiencing. So our job as mothers and as fathers is to help give our children language for what they are experiencing. We become the mirrors to help our children know who they are and what they're feeling. And this is an incredibly powerful concept that parents, I wish every parent knew this. When a child is feeling something and they're being big and loud and things like this, to put them in our arms and say, you are feeling sad. You are feeling angry. You are feeling lonely. And we are giving those children, our, our, our dear children, words to express what they're feeling. And the thing that happens then is when they know what they're feeling, they become soothed because they don't feel alone. And there's nothing worse than pain. If, the only thing worse than pain is feeling pain and feeling alone in that pain. That's what we always can help our children is we can help them not feel alone. So we become the mirrors so that eventually what ends up happening is they feel these big emotions and they say, wait a second, I know what I'm feeling because my mother has taught me. And they learn an internal language of emotion. And they are able to kind of, they're able to sort of cope with what they're experiencing because they first of all always know that mom and dad are near, but even if they're not near, they've been downloaded into them this sense of I get what's going on. And this is a thing that passes I am not my feelings, I'm having feelings, and these feelings will go away and I'm okay. So as moms and dads, we can mirror our children and give them sort of an emotional intelligence that helps them start to know who they are. And this is the beginning of identity development. All right, and if you guys have questions, I'm more than happy to answer them, so just feel free to raise your hand. All right, so then what ends up happening, if you move to the next point, is as children have the ability to, if, as parents, if we mirror our emotions and we mirror what they're experiencing and teach them how to know what they're experiencing, they learn that they can be soothed when they're feeling anxious, angry, distressed, that they can be soothed through healthy and loving relationships. They learn that even though we experience the slings and arrows of this life, that they don't have to overcome us and that we are not alone. We immediately come to know, if we're securely attached, that when I'm distressed, I move toward other people. And that begins, of course, like I've said many times already, with mom and dad. Um, and as we grow up, it moves into healthy attachment figures in our adult life, like a spouse. It can be a close friend, a sister, you know, like it, it starts to just, it starts in early life where we learn the pattern of distress, move toward people. All right. And the next one is, of course, that an identity of competence develops, that they start to learn who they are inside. They understand what their emotional experience is. Their emotions are allowed. They become soothed relationally. And then when we don't have the relationship near us, they actually get more adventurous to where they can go out and explore the world. And even if they get upset, they can become soothed within themselves because they know that their dear loved ones hold them within themselves. That like, even though I can't be with my mom, I know my mom loves me. And I know that she thinks I'm okay, so I'm okay. And I'm going to go home and I'm going to see her. And I'm going to be okay. And so the chaos level, the internal chaos level is very low. Even when they have the chaos, which we all will have. And that identity of competence develops starting very early. I mean, we're talking before a child can talk. They start learning... I'm precious, I'm beloved, I'm special, I'm unique, I'm enough. I heard the end of the sermon, we are enough. We're enough before we do or don't do anything. That is our divine birthright. And mothers and fathers have that gift to mirror that truth from God to our children. All right, let's move to the anxiously attached. All right, so... An anxiously attached child comes from parents, and I want to be very careful because I think all of us probably fall somewhere in the range of, you know, healthy to somewhere else depending on the day, right? Um, an anxiously attached parent is one who is fairly inconsistent. Sometimes they're there and sometimes they're not. There's quite a bit of chaos um, in, this, in this parent's life often. Um, oftentimes this parent um, either may be overly involved 
trying to sort of protect the child from anything, you know, happening in the world to the extent that the child sort of comes away feeling like they really can't do life without the protection of mom and dad. Or they sometimes will swoop in and then sometimes they're not there at all. The, the greatest example I ever heard of this was um, if a child is at the park and he wants to show mom what's going on, he wants to climb a tree or whatever, and mom sometimes watches, but she's usually sometimes doing her own thing. Um, what ends up happening is a child will tend to get very loud. Like they're scanning because they're not sure if she's going to be there or not. There's not a lot of trust that they can know that mom or dad is available. So you'll find um, that, that, that small children and moving into adulthood, those who are anxiously attached are very, very nervous. They need to stay very close in relationships because they're just not sure if that person's going to be there or not. Um, they tend to be very, um, have kind of characteristics of, of high degrees of neediness. Um, children will be very temper tantrumy because definitely mom will take care of me if I scream and yell and have a big fit. And that's not to say that every temper tantrum is from it because every child has temper tantrums, right? We're looking for patterns here. Um, but the, the, the anxiously attached child struggles because they don't know exactly how they feel and they don't have a consistent mirror. Sometimes they do, but oftentimes those who are, are anxiously attached, their moms and dads don't know exactly what they're feeling themselves, so they have a very difficult time sort of expressing and giving words, giving language to their children. All right, so I mentioned already that children that um, are anxiously attached get inconsistently soothed, so they tend to want to get loud. And then finally, um, they, they develop an identity of insecurity. And I will mention... Um, I'm always so careful to like, it's, it's not this clean and pretty, you know, it's not like everyone sits in one box 100% of the time. Um, but those of us who come from a variety of these different settings, I'll mention the one that I come from once we've gotten to the end, um, we come by these very honestly, you know, we, we do what we need to do and we do what, you know, we always have these healthy needs that need to be met. And so if we are anxiously attached, there's probably a good reason for that. It probably comes from our family of origin and, and our parents did their very best and whatever they gave us was their very best that came from their family of origin. So we're all just sort of broken in our own special ways and it's just our work to figure out how to become healed. All right, so let's move on to, um, to the avoidantly attached. The avoidantly attached child has a, an attachment figure that is very consistently not available. So that may be for any number of reasons. It could be work. It could be mental illness. It could be selfishness. It could be any number of things. Um, but that child learns from very young that I need to take care of myself. I don't have somebody to go to, and I'm going to be okay. These kids actually look really competent. I'm one of them. I'm a recovering, avoidantly attached child. Good grades. Get along well with people. Who needs people? I'm good to go. I'm fine. All right? Um, and they learn that very young because they never had a mirror to process their emotions, and so they don't really even actually understand what these whole things are that people talk about, which are emotions. They're kind of not comfortable with emotions, and often it's because they come from homes that are not comfortable with emotions either. Um, the child, the, the problem here is, though, is even though children that, that are avoidantly attached don't like to feel emotions, their physiology is feeling them all the time. They're feeling a lot in here. They don't know what they are. They don't have language for it. They don't have somebody to show them what they feel like. They don't have anybody to go to to say, it's okay. You're going to be just fine. You're sad. Of course you're sad. You didn't make the soccer team. That's a sad thing. You know, of course you're upset. You didn't get asked to prom. I get that. Let's, let's talk about it. They don't have somebody to bounce that kind of thing off of, and so they shove it down, and they just try their very hardest to not feel it. But the problem is, is that they need to be soothed still. They just don't have relationships to help them become soothed. And so they look elsewhere to become soothed. They look for non-relational ways of being soothed. And they develop this identity of detachment. That people, um, they, they can have a lot of uh, associations. They can do quite well in work and in school. But they don't really know how to have a healthy, intimate relationship with people. And they often even go through the stages and steps that look developmentally appropriate in our culture. They get married, they have children, but they really struggle with healthy levels of emotional, spiritual, um, sexual intimacies. They don't know how to do it. It's hard. Um, so 
to give a couple of quick examples with a securely attached child, let me just, I'm going to take you to something that I'm dealing with in my own home right now. I have a little boy. Um, my 11-year-old son is going through a weather thing. Very, very frightened about weather. And I finally, as a therapist, I actually sat him down in front of a sand tray a few days ago, and he did a sand tray for me. Um, my husband and I traveled a few months ago for a long weekend, and um, it was that weekend where there was the big, it was over, let me think, Memorial Day weekend, and it was, um, there was that tornado warning, and they, the Royals game was canceled. He had a birthday party at the Royals game. Um, and the, um, his grandma, who's a lovely woman, but wasn't, like, that day, I guess, wasn't on her, like, secure attachment game, was like, you're fine, you're fine, don't be scared, it's just a tornado, <laughs> which, you know, it's kind of a scary thing for a little kid, right? He was terrified, he was terrified, and from that moment on, he is very, very anxious about any sort of a weather situation, okay? So as a securely attached, I'm going to take you through this one scenario with a child, my child, um, and I, I'm, I'm 100% sure several years ago where I would have fallen, I would have said, you're fine. You're 11, get over it. Like, you know, like, be a big boy. You know, we've got a, we got a basement, and we can put something up in front of the... You know, I would have really invalidated his experience, thinking I was just trying to keep that little kid tough, okay? So a securely attached child to a mother is something very different. Every time he comes to me... I sit with him and I hold him and I say, you're so scared. Tornadoes are scary. What if that really did happen to us? I will keep you safe, but in the meantime, you stay near me because you're scared and tornadoes are scary. And I think we're going to be okay and I don't think a tornado is going to happen, but just in case, you stick near me, buddy. And it has grown our bond and many times when the storm passes figuratively and literally, he comes to me and says, Mom, thank you for keeping me safe. I trust you. I know you're going to keep me safe. An anxiously attached child would deal with somebody whose, whose parent is probably just as nervous about the thing, may be comforting, but may show as much fear and anxiety about whatever the child is worried about that they're not very soothing. And so while they stay near, sometimes they may not be near sometimes. It's just sort of depending on the day. Um, not soothing to a child because it sort of feeds into the fear. And then, of course, the avoidantly attached child will, will come with emotion and will be told, that emotion isn't okay. Be brave, you know. And that's, um, that's tough because in our culture we're very individualistic and just like, you can do it. We don't need people. We're awesome, you know. Like, and so this is sort of countercultural to say you're scared. It's okay. All right. So that's kind of the setup of what attachment language is and what the attachment styles are and all of us I mean I'm wondering I'm seeing you listening and watching and I'm I'm fairly certain because I've sat through something similar to this many years ago and I was really like oh man like stuff was coming together about like who like who who am I like what what is my sort of style and and this really this attachment language and the styles of who we are really comes into play when we're distressed in other words when we're just well life is good and you know we're just doing our thing this doesn't really come up but our attachment styles come up when we are in distress, when things get rough, when we're scared, angry, alone. That's when we sort of fall into one of those three categories of secure, insecure, or uh, anxious, and avoidant. And there's another one, but I won't go into it. It's too complicated. Okay, so let's move on to a couple of things that I want to sort of build on from that. When one does not know how to be soothed relationally, in times of anxiety and distress, he will learn other ways to be soothed. So we already, I'm, I'm building up to this. Hopefully this isn't a big surprise as I've been sort of trying to lead us down this path already. He will learn to be soothed, he or she will learn to be soothed non-relationally. Okay? And this is the birthplace of addiction. And... Um, when I say that, I mean this, any addiction, alcohol, drugs, gambling, shopping, food, sex, addiction is nothing more and nothing less than our desire to get a healthy need met in an unhealthy way. That's all it is. And we all know and love and maybe are someone who struggles with this. We have healthy needs and we work through difficult struggles and distress 
and sadness and loneliness and unemployment and mental illness and death and divorce and wayward children and all of these things. And it is hard. This life is not easy. And all of us deal with this. No one rides for free in this life. Am I right? And, and so what we need to know is that it's very, very difficult to do this alone. And if we learn from a young age that we can't reach out and do this in a way that, causes, that brings us healing through relationship with others, which leads us straight to relationship with God, then we'll figure out a way. And incidentally, sex addiction and food addiction are the two hardest ones because those are physiologically wired into us, right? We have to eat to live, and human sexuality keeps the human race going. And so it is, those are two tough ones because they are God-ordained. We are, we are made in the image of God, and he wants us here. We're here for a purpose. Um, and so it's a real struggle to sort of learn how to manage those. Uh, the other piece of it is, is when we're working through any sort of recovery, the other addictions, you can kind of cut them off. You can kind of turn your back on them and walk away. But we need to learn how to do food and human sexuality in a way that is healthy. And that's tricky. It's more complicated. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. Um, and just to kind of pick up where we left off, sexual addiction specifically is what we consider an intimacy disorder, meaning that coming from generally, you know, mainly it's mostly a, an avoidantly attached home. Um, those who struggle with sexual addiction generally have, have intense struggles with healthy intimacy. So to move to the next slide, here are just a couple of um, the most important points of that. Um, in a lot of the research that's been done, 97% of those who struggle with sexual addiction report that they in some way were emotionally neglected as children. Now that's a high statistic, 97%. That's kind of mind-blowing. Um, from my own clinical work, I want you to kind of think of it this way because I, I kind of like, I want you to, to frame this from sort of a first world neglect perspective, okay? So I have worked clinically, um, especially in my internship, I worked in a very, very low income, high need um, high school. And these are the kind of kids that one of the kids was pulling out a pen from his backpack and I noticed a whole backpack full of small cereal boxes and he kind of looked embarrassed and said, oh, I'm so sorry. He's like, I have to do that because otherwise my little sibling, my, my brothers and sisters don't eat over the weekend. I mean, so there's that side of neglect that these children in his home, they were not eating unless he brought home boxes of cereal a Friday afternoon. They didn't have food Saturday and Sunday until they got back to school and had school lunch. That's not what I'm talking about generally in the, in the population like where, where you and I reside, right? When, I, when I'm speaking of the 97% of those who struggle with neglect um, that, that have struggles with sexual addiction, I'm thinking of, of, of somebody I previously worked with who talked about being in a good home. Like, this is, these are good homes. These are present parents, moms and dads that are trying hard, that are very, very emotionally disengaged. For example, um, this sweet young man that I was working with talked about his father taking him out to lunch frequently and saying, I, I got to take some calls. You go on in and order, and I'll be right in. And dad never made it in or made it in when the kid was finishing his food, so dad had time to pay, that kind of thing. Um, or another example, you know, someone who um, experiences what the kids experience through elementary, middle, and high school, and the parents are just disengaged. They don't show up or they show up and they don't, there's no encouragement, um, sending children away when they're angry, you know, come back when you can be happy. Um, just a lot of very, um, it makes me highly uncomfortable to hear these stories because I see myself in these sometimes. I mean, I am that mom sometimes um, based on where I am that day. Just, I can't deal with your emotions, go to your room. Like, we'll talk, you know, or, or you know, or they're like, fine, it's okay, I don't talk about it, I'll just go play my, you know, my game. They, they go away because we're tired or we don't want to deal with it or their emotions make us super uncomfortable because they bring up our own lack of desire to deal with our own stuff, right? And so, so these kids struggle because they have these fractured childhood relationships um, where they didn't have anywhere to go. They didn't learn how to be soothed emotionally as children. On to the next point. Those who struggle with intimacy almost always 
were raised where um, full range of emotions were not allowed. Um, they don't know how to relationally soothe. And when in pain, they learn to further isolate themselves and soothe themselves non-relationally. Um, so to move on to the next slide, the opposite of love is isolation. I don't think it's hate. I think isolation is the opposite of love, meaning that our children and our more so maybe even, I don't know, I've got these middle schoolers and high schoolers, they need us near. They need us really close by. They need to know that we are available, even in those late, I was exhausted last night, my two girls came home from a, a church dance and I had to hear about everything, you know, because that's what my job is. Like, I don't want them to feel like they have to go away and find that comfort from somewhere else. And so our work together today is to learn how to help our children stay securely attached to us so that they learn from our mentoring that when they face what they're going to face inevitably in this life, they're going to learn to do it relationally. And that is the greatest sort of upstream prevention policy for helping our children when they encounter what they are going to encounter around issues of sexual addiction. It's not a question of if they are exposed. It's a question in this day and age of when they will be exposed. Will they have the tools and will they have the relationships to know that when I struggle, I can go home and I have someone who will be there for me to talk to me. And so to finish up today, and we're gonna, I'm, I'm grateful that we got through um, because we're going to have some time to, to, to talk and interact, which is my favorite part. I want to close back with some sheep, a sheep story. Um, I want to turn to Matthew chapter 18, verses 12 through 14. And it says this, How think ye if a man had a hundred sheep, and one, of them, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seek that which has gone astray. And if it so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not, even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. And I think about this story, when I think about this, I was discussing this lesson with my husband, and I think about my husband sometimes um, in parenting because he has a paradigm. We're parenting and we're struggling and we don't know what to do. Our poor first child is like our crash test dummy on everything. I feel so bad for her. <laughs> and he often says, um, how would Heavenly Father, how does Heavenly Father parent us? Like, what would he do? And as I think about that, I think about this. We're always enough. He doesn't send us away. He wants us near. That is what secure attachment is. And our children will learn through being securely attached to us what it looks like to be securely attached to our God. And if we can tolerate the struggles that they go through and help them really know that we are there, that they can come to us no matter what's going on, that all topics are allowed and that we are, are not going to go away, then we can help them learn that when they fight those battles that they're inevitably going to fight, they come closer to God through our relationship. And then they can go out there into the world and they can be exposed to that stuff that scares us as parents to death. And they have a safe base at home. And they know they can return to us. And even when they see that stuff, they can turn away. They have power. They have God's power with them that hopefully we at home are instilling in them through our relationship. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Now, tell me if I'm right here, Pastor Scott. We have some discussion questions. How did you want to... We were going to... I think if I'm... If I'm we, when we discussed this, we were going to take a few minutes in small groups, let you guys discuss, and then come back together and, and have a little bit of a discussion about what we learned or questions or whatever. So...